Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We're very happy today to have uh, Sophia Economo from the Center for Quantum Information Science and Engineering at Virginia Tech University, who is going to tell us about control and distribution of entanglement in quantum networks. Sophia, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the introduction. And um, this is an informal uh, settings from my point of view, at least. So feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. If there's anything I can clarify as I go along. Um, yeah, so I think for this audience, this is too elementary, but I just have a few introductory slides. I try to make this as a colloquium. Um, so let me just uh, introduce these um, uh, in case there are any students in the, in the seminar, and then I'll uh, get into more technical things. Okay, so in all the quantum technologies, we talk about quantum bits, qubits, which are two-level systems. Uh, in this talk, these two level systems will be polarization of photon later on and uh, the two levels of a uh, electronic or nuclear spin. Of course, these can be put in a superposition. Um, they can get they, they can um, be controlled into entangled states, which is very important for quantum technologies. And a big part of my talk will be how do we create these entangled states in different physical settings? And of course, measurement is uh, unique in uh, quantum mechanics. It's probabilistic and it's reversible, uh, meaning that it changes the quantum state in general. And finally, there's of course the non-cloning theorem that tells us that unknown quantum states cannot be copied. And that leads to information security and quantum key distribution, et cetera. Okay, so entanglement will, will be a big part of the talk. So let me just uh, give a few definitions and a few um, an introduction to the pictorial representation I'll be using. So an example of an entangled state is of course uh, this Bell state over here. And the fact that it's entangled means that it cannot be written as a tensor product of um, separ separable uh, qubit states like here. And one thing that's distinct about such states is that if there's a measurement on one of these uh, two qubits in this case. <clears throat> uh, while that measurement outcome <clears throat> excuse me, is entirely um, uh, probabilistic because each qubit separately does not have a well-defined state, after the measurement uh, where now you have separated the two uh, subsystems and the one you measured, you know its state, then you immediately also know the state of the other one. And this, of course, is a resource for uh, quantum information technologies, including quantum communication networks and quantum computing. And in this talk, I'll be using this pictorial representation. In the beginning of the talk, it'll be um, just, just a picture. So each circle is a qubit and the line denotes entanglement. I'll make this more rigorous in the second part of the talk where um, uh, I'll talk about graph states. But for now, just think of this as an entangled state. In particular, this is a Bell pair. Okay, so why are we interested in quantum networks? There's many things we'd like to do that either cannot be done classically or can be done better uh, with quantum information if we manage to uh, realize these technologies. So one application is, of course, cryptographic protocols such as QKD, uh, and various multipartite cryptographic protocols, such as uh, su such as secret sharing, et cetera, shown here. Um, another thing you can do is things like synchronize clocks, uh, extend the baseline of telescopes, shown over here. And uh, very interestingly, you can also do blind quantum computing, which means that you can send um, securely photons uh, in a network or some, some information carrier, usually it's photons, and access a cloud quantum computer in a way that even the operator, in this case, Alice, of that quantum computer um, does not know what you're running, does not know um, the algorithm or even the, the size of the algorithm. So there's some nice, uh, there's a nice review by Stephanie uh, Weiner from a few years ago, 
describing mostly the applications of these networks and what is needed at every stage of the technology to achieve them. And more recently, um, my collaborators and I have put out a review that's um, more, more general. It also talks about the physical implementations, uh, different generations of quantum repeaters, et cetera. So if you're interested, uh, it's, it's available on the archive. It's still not published. So also if you have feedback, we're happy uh, to hear it. Okay, so <clears throat> what, what is limiting us and we don't have these uh, long distance quantum networks yet? Um, so, so first let's think about how we would actually implement them, how we'd get them. Again, I mentioned that we want to share entanglement. And one simple thing conceptually would be that Alice prepares a bell state. One of the two qubits would be a photon so that she can send it down uh, an optical fiber and uh, establish an entangled pair that's now distributed in space. One problem with this is that uh, photons are absorbed in optical fibers. Uh, for example, after 100 kilometers, uh, there's 1% probability that the photon will survive. And of course, that's not something you would want with your uh, information carrier. And in, in classical mechanics, um, classical approach, there are things you can do, like measure the signal amplified in these repeater stations. Here, things are more subtle because, uh, as we mentioned before, unknown um, measurement destroys the state and we cannot copy uh, quantum states. So this classical approach is not directly viable. One simple thing we can do as a first step is break up the distance between Alice and Bob. Uh, and put a station in the middle, which we'll call Charlie over here. And now Charlie generates the bell pair. So now Charlie has this bell pair and he has to send one photon to Alice and one to Bob. And this you see already improves the situation because this photon now has to travel half the distance. Of course, you're not done solving your problem because if you want to um, share information, let's say between the West Coast and the East Coast of the US, or between uh, US and another continent, then uh, you'll still have the same problem where the photons will be absorbed. So we want to have some version of this idea that we that is scalable. And that's the idea of a quantum repeater. And I want to show the building blocks of it, the conceptual building blocks before uh, I introduce them. So now consider that Charlie prepares two bell states instead of one. And again, he sends uh, one put on one side and on the other uh, from different bell pairs shown in the schematic. And then he can make a bell state measurement, which means that instead of measuring in the independent uh, basis of each qubit, he first does an entangling operation and then measures. And what that does is it projects these two photons in the middle, these two, they can be other, they don't have to be photons, they can be spins. These two qubits in the middle, it projects them onto a bell state because that's the basis in which you measure. So that should be clear. But then what happens when uh, he does that is that Alice's and Bob's qubits, which up to this point did not have any correlation, become entangled with each other. So now this is a primitive that's actually quite powerful because it allows you to spread entanglement over a larger distance in, in a way that is scalable. And this is called entanglement swapping uh, or heralded entanglement because this action here of making this measurement tells you that these two qubits over here shown uh, remote, uh, the remote ones from each other have been entangled. And before I talk about how to scale this, let's just think about how you would implement this physically. So of course you need some system that has an optical interface. Um, so going back to the previous slide, you can imagine um, that these middle qubits over here that are projected into the bell uh, basis are spins uh, or some atom that has um, a ground state uh, spin structure or the MV center that we discussed before and I'll discuss quite a bit in this talk. And then these uh, qubits that are sent out are photons. 
So we need some system that has an optical interface. For now, it's going to be some abstract system. I'm going to zoom into physical platform soon. And um, you, you can, so, so we have these two lower levels. Uh, think of it as spin up and down. And then there's an excited state. There's many incarnations of this level structure that can be generalized, but for now, let's think of the simple one. So the idea is that you pump optically um, and you, you can imagine that you have a laser that's resonant to the up E transition and does not see the other transition. So first you create an equal superposition of up and down, and then you excite your system. And if you do that, you get a uh, superposition, equal superposition of E and down because down has not been affected by this field. And then you just let the system relax. And in this process, it emits a photon to go from E to up. So the net effect of this um, whole procedure of, and of putting the spin in a superposition optically exciting and then letting the system spontaneously emit a photon, leads um, to a bell state between the spin and the photon. And the degree of freedom of the photon over here is actually the occupation number. So you see that you have a spin up uh, tensor with a photon in, in some particular mode, which is given by this transition, plus spin down tensor with a vacuum. So zero here corresponds to the vacuum of the electromagnetic field. And this is uh, an entangled state, and you can use it to do entanglement swap. So in terms of physical implementations, as I mentioned, you need a system that has an optical interface. So if we look at our candidate qubits over here, there are qubits that are very uh, promising for quantum computing, but don't have, uh, might, might or might not have an optical interface. Actually, trap times have an optical interface. They're not as fast as atomic, I'm sorry, as uh, spin qubits. So I'm gonna be focusing on spin qubits uh, as the optically active uh, qubit. And in my talk, because I'll be talking on uh, about quantum networks, I'm gonna focus on these three types of systems. Actually, I'm gonna focus on defects more than quantum dots. Some of the things I'll talk about are transferable to self-assembled quantum dots. Okay, so specifically narrowing into the MV center in Diamond. You heard a talk already today, so I can probably be quite brief here. This is a complex of a missing carbon in the Diamond lattice and the substitution of nitrogen, um, which are at nearest neighbor positions. Um, and if you look into the electronic structure of this defect, you will find out that there is a ground state, um, spinful ground state. So these three levels, uh, plus minus one and zero, are the uh, different spin projections along some uh, z-axis of uh, a spin one manifold, which has to do with a number, there's a number of electrons associated with it. And then there's the optical uh, transitions that go up to excited states. And there's also these metal stable states we use uh, to initialize, but I'm not going to be talking about that. All right, but the important thing is that you, you can select two levels out of these three and create a qubit, and it has the desirable properties of the optical interface where only one of the qub qubit states couples to the excited. And you control the system optically, as I just mentioned, mainly for readout and initialization, and also to create the bell state. And you can also use microwave fields um, between your qubit levels down here, which implement the un unitary control. OK, so how do you use this uh, for quantum communications? It's, this is exactly the uh, protocol I discussed. This is the qubit on the left that emits a photon, similar in a different uh, diamond sample. Another MV emits a photon. And if you send these photons to a beam splitter and then make measurements, uh, you, you can probabilistically get, um, get the, the state you want. So get uh, uh, entanglement swapping. So basically what happens, this net effect of the beam splitter and the measurement 
of the photons is the projection onto the Bell basis. I'll come back to this uh, issue that the Bell measurement is probabilistic for photons. So this is an experiment that has that is being has been done in many platforms. So proof of principle uh, experiments are now. Um, I don't know if I want to call them a routine, but they have been done in many labs around the world. But I want to highlight this one because um, this demonstrated entanglement between, between two MVs that are located more than a kilometer from each other. Uh, and this was done at Delft. And you see here, Charlie's the C over here. Um, there's an MV center at point A and an, another MV center at point B. And the photons are sent down optical fibers shown by the yellow lines. But of course, this is not enough yet, uh, because to have a quantum network, as I mentioned before, we need to scale this up to more than two nodes, more than Alice and Bob. And the idea is to concatenate the scheme, um, the, the entanglement swapping paradigm, in a way um, that we can now chop the distance into smaller pieces and create an entangled state between Alice and Bob. So in this example here, you see that instead of one Charlie in the middle, I have a bunch of them. And there's these intermediate nodes where the Bell state measurement happens. So in the primary node, we have these quantum memories or the MV centers in our case. And the photons are sent down this red uh, path. This is spatially, this red uh, station is se spatially separated in the middle between these two. And you basically do these projective Bell state measurements at the red nodes and uh, extend the entanglement. So this is shown a little bit more abstractly here. Um, so the blue circles over here are the atomic or MV systems, some matter qubit that has the spin memory. The blue, I'm sorry, the green circles are the photons that are generated from each. And you see that in each node, you have these, um, uh, let's say, two MV centers. Each emits a photon. The photons from neighboring nodes are sent in the intermediate node, secondary node, and they're Bell measured. And the way this works is you do these Bell state measurements so that the photons are now gone from the picture. And you have these um, extended Bell pairs between the memories. And then you do locally at each node another Bell state measurement. So those are gone. And then uh, you're basically done. And you have managed to extend the entanglement out without having the photons, without the photons having to travel more uh, than needed. Yes, question? I have a quick question. So how close are the two NV centers in a same, in a node, in a particular node? Um, so you can think of them as being in the same lab. They could be in the same optical table, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, they they don't have to, so long as they're you know somewhere in the same space, so that you can make this measurement. And um, their orientation, everything has to be same, or that also does not matter. I don't think it matters. You need to have them well characterized, mm -hmm. um, so that you know what they're doing. But other than that, yeah. mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah, so you see here that we need at least two um, matter qubits per node. Um, so we need additional spin qubits. As, as I mentioned, you could have two MV centers, like two different um, diamond samples, in which case you would need to do another um, Bell state measurement locally, presumably maybe the same way you would emit the photons locally. That might be problematic because you need the spell me state measurement to succeed. So to do something a little bit more, uh, hopefully more deterministic, one thing you can do is you can use, in the case of DMV, nuclear spins that are randomly located in the lattice. So the, the majority isotope in carbon is 12, which is spin zero, but there are also 1% occurrence uh, carbon 13. So this means that Together with your MV center, you are handed um, for free, so to speak, these carbon 13s, which are also spin a half systems. 
And if you're clever about you know, what to do with them, you can actually use them as a resource. Before you, you know, before we think about using them as a resource, the obvious thing these spins do is cause the coherence to your MV Center spin. So they can be a problem, but they can also be a resource. And I'll show you how they can be a resource. And a reason they're attractive is that nuclear spins interact more weakly uh, with fields, magnetic fields. So they are good memory qubits. So we need to know how to leverage them. So let me show you how the protocol works in principle, and then I'll talk more about the physics of how they are controlled. So for now, let's just assume that the, I, we have a way to control the interaction between the MV center uh, spin and these uh, C13 nuclear spins. All right, so we have, uh, and here the MV center is shown with purple, and the orange represents um, two carbon 13s that are um, sort of been identified in this lattice. So first we do um, this Bell state measurement uh, with the photons that are emitted from DMV, which means that we have created uh, a Bell state between the two MV centers. So you, you should imagine each of these diamond um, uh, samples sitting in different labs that are spatially separated. Okay, so now we have created this entangling line. The next thing we want to do is use uh, these nuclear spins to store the state of the purple spin, the MV. So we're going to do a swap gate and store the state over there. And now it's the nuclear spins that are entangled with each other, shown pictorially by the, by the orange line. And what this does is it uses these long-lived memory qubits to store a state. But it also frees up the MV, which is the optical interface, to be able to interact again, um, to emit another photon and repeat the scheme with a different uh, physical location, the neighbor to the other side. Um, so this is how you can extend, uh, extend this. And then the last... Um, so, so the step I'm not showing here is that you would create an orange line between this free nuclear spin over here and its counterpart. And then once you have created that, you would need some way to measure these two nuclear spins over here in a Bell state. So in this example, um, they're both inside the same uh, diamond sample. Okay, so some of these things have been done actually. And uh, pioneering experiments uh, were done again by the Delft group. Uh, this this uh, came out a few years ago, where they showed three qubit entanglements, specifically creating a GHZ state. Um, and the GHZ state was between um, two MV centers and a nuclear spin shown over here, again, activated through the MV center. So three different mm, diamond samples. Um, so this is the same concept I showed you in an experimental demonstration. They measured various quantities to show that they really have genuine three-way entanglement. Okay, so how, how is this done physically? Now let's, let's start talking about the actual physics. So the Hamiltonian that will give you the interaction, that describes the interaction that will allow us to implement the gate is a dipole-dipole, magnetic dipole-dipole Hamiltonian. Uh, shown as such. You can manipulate it a little bit. I'm not going to talk about that step. Um, you can manipulate it and use the fact that there's a large Zeeman mismatch between the electron and the nuclear spin. And you can rewrite it approximately in the form shown over here. So you have a term um, that is the Zeeman splitting. And, and this is the, the hyperfine piece, right? So this is there's a term that's the Larmor um, term of the nuclear spin. Um, there's a ZZ term, so these are Pauli operators. And there is also a ZX term. So the second operator over here refers to the nuclear spin. So what this uh, tells you is that the ele uh, electron spin, which is the MV spin, will not flip, right? It just has Z operators or identities. But the, there's a term that can flip a nuclear spin. All right, so this is the Hamiltonian I'll be focusing on. 
Um, yeah, and we already discussed this. So there's two hyperfine couplings that enter over here, a parallel and the uh, um, uh, 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 vertical. And this Hamiltonian now, in principle, allows for entanglement generation. So you can manipulate this Hamiltonian a little bit more and write it in the following way that will end up being very useful. So you have a projector on the electron spin, the, 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 the defect. Um, tensor with a Hamiltonian on a nuclear spin, plus the projector on the other state of the defect or the MV, tensor with a different Hamilton. And now if we take this Hamiltonian and exponentiate it to get the evolution operator, we're gonna see that the evolution operator has the same form. It inherits this form from uh, the Hamiltonian. So this is the evolution operator. Again, projector on the NV tensor with different uh, in rotations of the nuclear spin. And the reason I'm allowed to write these as rotation operators is that I can do that for any uh, unitary operator uh, of a qubit. I can write it as a as a um, as a rotation. So there's going to be some axis of rotation and angle of rotation that characterize this operator. Okay, so what I just showed you described the MV and one nuclear spin. But in reality, I have a whole bunch of them, like I said, uh, according to this 1% occurrence. And moreover, these are interactions that are always there. You know, unlike some human-made devices, this is not an interaction I can just switch on and off. Um, and another thing I'm gonna assume in this talk, you don't have to, experimentally, you can also do an MR directly on the nuclear spins, but for simplicity of implementation, I'm going to assume that I can only drive the, the MV, that I, I'm not gonna do any NMR directly on the nuclear spins. Of course, if you, if you can do that, you have extra knobs, so you can do some things uh, more easily at least conceptual. All right, so as I said, you have these always on interactions, that can be a problem. Um, so what you, you can do is use tricks that people have been doing in NMR for decades, uh, basically do use the coupling sequences. So you can send impulses such that the interactions are essentially averaged out. The most famous such sequence is the spin echo, where you can imagine you have a bunch of spins or a single spin in different uh, occurrences in time, either way. And as this spin processes are on a magnetic field, um, if you think of a bunch of different spins, they process at a different rate. So some are fast, some are slow. But then what you can do is you can reverse them, uh, do a rotation, such that you promote um, the slow ones to first and the uh, fast ones last, and then wait the same amount of time from the first to the second. Uh, snapshot here, and the, they all re refocus. And this, of course, is known as spin echo. There exist more complicated versions of spin echo. One example, CPMG, which is sort of a periodic version of spin echo, but you see in the beginning and the end, you have half a period. And you can have, you can repeat this sequence over and over um, as we're going to do here. Okay, so we're gonna use exactly this idea, use these CPMG drives. It doesn't have to be CPMG and the work I'll show you is general. It applies to any sequence, but for now let's assume for, for simplicity that that's the sequence we're looking at. And basically what you have here is you have these pi pulses similar to spin echo. And you have a time that characterizes each sort of uh, building block of your uh, dynamical decoupling sequence. And if you concatenate, if you if you put n of those, um, then you just create a larger sequence with the same characteristic time t uh, as the effective period. Uh, but of course, we don't want to decouple all the nuclei. We want to have some way of choosing these parameters shown over here, especially the t, as I'll show you, such that the nuclei you want to remain coupled. Uh, demonstrated here by the darker orange, are coupled, and the ones you want to decouple are decoupled. Um, so you have these two knobs, you have the time t, and you, you also control how many times you send in this sequence. 
And you, what you can find, and this was done by the Delft group around 10 years ago, is that the resonance time um, is a function of these hyperfine parameters. K here is an integer. So that if you tune your pulses, um, the spacing of the pulses uh, in such a way, then you pick up uh, or, or you don't decouple the nuclear spin that has this A uh, parameter. The other A also enters, but it, it, it enters in a way that can be approximated to zero. So this is what they did here uh, in this experiment that I mentioned. Um, so by changing the pulse spacing, they can select out to different nuclear spins. Don't worry too much about um, the y-axis. It's basically the signal you get. It tells you which nuclear spin you're reading out, essentially. And by looking at these resonances, you can see there's a nuclear spin um, uh, sitting, uh, sitting over here. And this particular example is for 32 repetitions of this elementary um, uh, unit. Okay, and now you still, um, okay, so when you do one of these, one of these iterations, you have an evolution between your, joint evolution between your MV and the nuclear spin that can be written this way. And you can think of it pictorially like the electron is up, the nuclear spin rotates about some axis um, one way, and if the uh, spin is down, it rotates the other way. Okay, but this is not the whole story. So, so, you know, if you can do this, then you can tune things over here such that you can get the gate you want, for example, a C0 gate. But this is not, not the whole story because dynamic decoupling sequences are not perfect. So when you tune your parameters such that you select a particular nuclear spin, you're actually not guaranteed that the remaining nuclear spins are fully decoupled. And the way this was done prior to the work I'll show you was to first select um, a nuclear spin the way I described here, and then go and do uh, numerical work to see what's the effect on the other nuclear spins. And if that was not good, not good enough, then repeat. And of course, because you cannot simulate arbitrarily large uh, quantum systems, there's um, classically uh, uh, there's a cutoff quite, quite, you know, below the number of interest. This is a very uh, limited approach, restricted. But what I'll show you in the next few minutes is that we can actually include all the nuclei in the description, and we can have analytical tools to do that. So let's go back and look at the evolution operator. The evolution operator has a very special form. You have this projector on the electron, tensored with rotation operators on the nuclear spins, plus the other projector tensor with a different operation on each nuclear spin. So this is not a generic evolution operator. It's very specific. It has a very uh, special form. So what, uh, what we have done, and in fact, my student Eva Taku, who has done amazing work, is realize that this problem can be tackled um, analytically. Uh, from a theory point of view, by using this tool of one tangle. So I'm not going to go through the equation, but I just want to give you a sense of what it is. If you have a many qubit system, you can ask how entangled is one qubit to the rest of the qubits. Okay. So you can select out the qubit of interest and ask this question, and then you can change which one you select out. So in this example over here, um, you can select out this nuclear spin, or you can select out this nuclear spin, et cetera. Or you can select out the electronic spin. You can generalize this concept to evolution operators by averaging over product states. So basically what you're asking is, if I implement, if I have this evolution operator that acts on the whole system, how much entanglement does it cause to this particular spin or particular qubit I'm selecting out? And what's remarkable here is that for the particular form of the Hamiltonian I just showed you in the previous slide, you can actually find these expressions analytically. So each nuclear spin um, has this form, this GIL 
tell you in a moment what it is. It depends on each nuclear spin. So there should be an index here, I and I. Um, and the electronic spin um, can also be analytically, um, the one tangle uh, of the electronic spin can also be analytically derived. So let me uh, tell you what these Gs are. Although we also have analytical expressions for those. So to that, for that, let me take a step back and think about a two qubit gate. This is a generic two qubit gate. Any two qubit gate, you can decompose it in this form. You can write it as a piece that is single qubit gates on each qubit shown over here. So this is a product. Sandwiching a purely two qubit interaction or, or evolution in the middle expressed by this A and followed by another set of single qubit rotations, uh, which is the K2. Sometimes it's called the CAC decomposition. So you see what we, we've done by writing it this way is we separated out things that are not purely two qubit operators. And then you can describe equivalent classes if you don't care about local operations, which oftentimes we don't. Uh, and you can figure out uh, how, how gates of interest relate to these alpha beta gammas. So for example, the C0 gate, uh, that's a famous gate in quantum computing, and the CZ gate are equivalent up to uh, single qubit rotations. So their middle part will be the same. And then we can define something called Macklin invariance. I'm sure I should have put the reference of this paper here. Uh, this is a paper by Macklin, a single author paper, where he showed they can define these quantities that are functions of this alpha, beta, gamma. Um, and these now define different classes of entanglement. For example, I mentioned the C0. The C0 class is described by G1 equals zero, G2 equals one. And you can characterize things like swap, square root of swap, and all these gates we know uh, from quantum computing. So for this uh, system, the Hamiltonian I showed you, the multi-qubit one tangles only depend on the pairwise Macklin invariance. So all we need to do is look at a sequence and solve for uh, the electron and one nuclear spin and do that for all the nuclear spins, right? That's easy to do just a two-qubit system. Extract the Gs. And then we have a description of the multi-qubit system. And this is exact. We have not made approximation. Okay, so now what can you do with this? Now you can systematically and efficiently uh, figure out how to do your gates. Because if you have a target spin, you can go and calculate uh, the, these one tangles for the spins you are, want to avoid. And in this plot over here, we're selecting one nuclear spin. So that's characterized by these A parameters. And what we're doing is we're looking at other values of the A's and seeing what are the one tangles for these other nuclear spins. So this tells you for a particular sequence that you're interested in, how much does it couple to nuclear spins that have these parameters? Of course, in real life, these are not continua like this. Your nuclear spins are sitting at particular positions. So if you see something that's dark over here, it means that nuclear spin with those parameters couples a lot. If you want to avoid that, then you're going to go and pick a different sequence. Uh, you can also construct single shot multi-qubit gates because you can look now at the number of target nuclei instead of just looking at one at a time, you might want to do a genuine four qubit gate, for example. And then you can look which uh, nuclear spins have one tangles that are above some cutoff value that you can set. In this example, I think we set it to around 0.8, no, sorry, 0.9 something. Um, and you can see that there was some sequence that could select four nuclei out while successfully um, decoupling the rest. Um, so uh, Eva, the student who uh, did this work, went and looked at experimental data. So the Delft group, uh, Tim Tamignon's group at Delft has done uh, very elaborate work on characterizing this 27 uh, nuclear spin system. I, I believe now it's up to 50 spins, but this was from their 2019 work, where they have figured out all the parameters for these nuclear spins that are coupled to a particular MV center they work with. So these are available in the literature. 
and you can take these numbers and so and test different decoupling sequences. So Eva um, tested 135 different decoupling sequences. And um, the input here is the one tangling power cutoff. So what you consider strongly coupled nuclei is given by something you input as your um, threshold. And if you do that, you can ask for a given sequence, which is given from each of these uh, points. That's what the case number means over here, different sequences. How many nuclei are strongly involved in this operation? And you can see it can be up to seven. And in some cases, it can be only two. And then you can ask also, how long do these gates take? And what is the error compared to the ideal case? So you can very systematically characterize multi-qubit, general multi-qubit operations, or just two qubit gates uh, with this formalism. And you can do more things. You can generate GHZ states uh, of nuclear spins at a single shot. And this is follow-up work Eva has recently done as well. Okay, so let me summarize this part of the talk and then I'll and then in the last maybe five-ish minutes, I'll show you a different related but different direction. So this is a powerful formalism. It allows you to sort through uh, defects, figure out which ones are viable for quantum information based on the um, nuclear spins they're coupled to. And then you can identify which nuclear spins are going to participate in your protocol and which you want to avoid. But these are does not address all the challenges we have. There's more challenges we need to deal with. One thing can I mentioned earlier. Question, sure, of course. Yeah, yeah. So in the previous, when you say different decoupling sequences, uh, what is it? In the dynamic decoupling, are you changing power or the delays? No, so the power is fixed because we are always doing uh, uh, pi poles on mm -hmm. the MV, mm -hmm. uh, what changes is the spacing between the, uh, mm -hmm. if we fix the sequence to be CPMG, for example, mm -hmm. then the spacing is fixed, but this formalism also allows you to choose other sequences. So there mm -hmm. exist sequences like something called Ulrich, where the spacings are not fixed, they change throughout the period. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, any other sequence you can come up with. Actually, we, we have a parallel effort where we come up with sequences that are decoupling, and they might not look kind of the way you know from an MR, they might look more general, uh, but any sequence works. So the sequence itself is one input, the spacing. If your sequence is complicated, the spacings, right? You need some formula that tells you the spacings between your unit. And mm -hmm. then how many times you repeat it. Those are your knobs. Okay. And these are under magnetic field, under some magnetic yes, field. Yes, yes. There's a magnetic field to split, uh, split the levels of the MV center and the nuclear spin, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And again, let me also take the opportunity to point out that we are not driving directly the nuclei here. We're driving the central spin, the, the MV. But of course you can combine this with also driving the nuclear spins. That'll just give you more, more knobs to play with. All right, so in the last maybe five-ish to 10 minutes, depending on how, much, how many questions there are, I can take five or 10 minutes. I can start and see how it goes. And uh, please interrupt me again if you have questions. So, so what I just described solves a big part of um, these types of repeaters. It helps you manipulate locally your register quite well. What do we still have not addressed is the fact that this Bell state measurement is probabilistic uh, for photonic qubits. So this means you need to repeat until success multiple times, which slows down your rate of entanglement generation. Inherent in this type of repeater is the fact that you need to send information back to the node that emitted the photon. You need to tell this node over here, did this Bell state measurement succeed or not? And did this Bell state measurement succeed or not? And when it does, you need to do this projective measurement over here, but you should not do it before this succeeds. So this also slows down the rate. And then of course your quantum numbers have to be very long lived, these nuclear spins, have to be coherent and store information while your MV is trying to establish entanglement with another MV um, with this Bell state measure. So to address this, uh, people have pro proposed different types of repeaters, specifically all photonic repeaters. 
So there's an attempt to get rid of the memory qubits. So everything I told you would be obsolete <laughs> almost. Uh, I'll get back to that. If we manage to do all photonic quantum information processing for repeaters. So the idea is that instead of relying on memory qubits to store the information, you somehow manage to create photonic states that are loss tolerant um, or that can be manipulated um, kind of along their, the path of propagation in a way that errors are correct. The paradigm I'll focus on is creating these many uh, photon entangled states and describe how we would avoid um, how would avoid some of the issues from the previous slide. So let me just give, show you a big picture. I'm not expecting you to follow this thing. I'll, I'll break it down for you. So now you have these primary nodes shown in purple, uh, where instead of having a quantum memory, you have some procedure for creating highly entangled photonic states. So every circle you see over here is a photon. The lines that are entanglement, I'll get to exactly what they mean. Um, and then you have these intermediate stations where you make the measurement. And now you see that you, all the photons are sent away. So there's no qubits remaining at the primary node, this purple node over here. And I'll show you why this works, but first let me define, make some definitions. So the states we'll be talking about are multi-photonic states shown like this. This is a 12 photon state. Every circle is a photon, a qubit. And the way you think about the state is that every for every circle, every qubit, you put it in the state zero plus one. And every line you see is a CZ gate. So this is the protocol for writing down a state like this. And there's actually an alternative definition in terms of stabilizers, if that means something to you, which are operators that have the state as a uh, joint eigenstate with eigenvalue one. And let me show you an example. Um, this is a state that's locally equivalent to the GHZ state. And it's a graph state that can be generated with the procedure I showed you. And it's not hard to convince yourself that this is an eigenstate of these three Pauli operators with eigenvalue one. So we call these stabilizers. And you can check, for example, if I apply X on the first qubit, from this term, I just get back plus, Z on the second, I get back zero. So this term is not affected. If I apply X on this, on minus, I get a minus sign, but I also get a minus sign from Z on one, which cancel and I get back the same state. And you can walk through the rest and convince yourself that this is indeed an eigenstate. Now these states are special in quantum information. They can be used as resources for quantum computing in a particular incarnation. And they also have nice properties on their measurement. So if I measure uh, along the z-axis, I decouple that particular qubit. If I make a measurement along the x-axis into neighboring qubits, I get rid of those qubits, but I also sort of entangle and swap over here and create a link between their neighbors. So these are the properties that are important for this paradigm of uh, all photonic repeaters. And the idea is that you create this state at every node and then you send all the photons away, half on one side and half on the other. So I'll show you a cartoon of that. So you see that in this measurement node, you receive all the photons. Now you're gonna do Bell state measurements the same way you did in entanglement swapping in the previous paradigm. And what's special here is that you have multiple photons, pairs of photons that arrive. So you have the opportunity to repeat the Bell state measurement until it succeeds. Because it's probabilistic, this redundancy helps you. So let's say one of them succeeds. No matter what happens over here, you don't care anymore because you have this link. And now what you need to do is get rid of the photons that have remained here in a way that these photons um, that are connected to the Bell state measurement that either failed or has not happened yet go away, and that these ones also go away, but in a way that your entanglement line is connected. So as we mentioned, the Z measurement gets rid of that qubit and doesn't change the graph. So you get this. And the next measurement connects uh, the neighbors of the qubits that are measured. 
So if you X measure these neighboring qubits, you connect their neighbors, and then you create these green dots would be gone and you create an entanglement line across. There are subtleties with this. You need to actually redundantly encode some of the photons um, under some error correction code. I'm gonna skip that. Um, but the idea is that instead of a single photon, you might have a logical photon, which is really comprised of a bunch of different photons. I'll skip these. And the main part of our work in my group is how do we generate these states? And you can generate them probabilistically, which is what people are exploring uh, mostly at the, at, the, at the moment. But here you see just to get a three photon state, which is much less, much smaller than what you really want, the probability to get this is one over 32. And that's because the Bell state measurements are probabilistic. So you pay this probab high probability price or, or rather low probability price uh, every time you try to connect photons. Um, and because of this bottleneck, it, it's difficult to implement the scheme just with linear optics. And it was shown in this uh, publication that you would need on the order of a million single photon sources per node um, to beat the repeaterless bound in terms of uh, rates that you can create, uh, send information. So what we're interested in is going back to our friends, um, the MV centers or other defects, quantum emitters, and now use them not as memory qubits, but as emitters to create the states we're interested in. And you can think of doing this in two ways. You can have a bunch of different emitters and tangle those to each other, and then do a transduction step to map the state onto a photonic state, shown on the left. Something else you can do is exchange spatial resources, number of qubits, with temporal resources and pump photons out sequentially. So here you use fewer qubits to get out the same state, but you get it over time. And of course, our quantum emitters have this uh, spin photon interface. So in principle, we can do it. And you can show that if you have a four level system shown over here that has some selection rule, in this case, polarization, you can pump it and do an uh, operation between the spin states and you can get a one dimensional uh, state like that. There's been a lot of experiments or, or rather there are starting to be a lot of experiments on this. Uh, the early experiments were by the Gershoni group in Israel more recently, uh, Rempes group in Germany has done really nice experiments showing more than 10 photonic qubits generated from a single atomic emitter. And uh, Pascal Senelar's group uh, recently has also shown entanglement um, that is very fast generated because of a cavity that enhances spontaneous emission rate. So I'll show you this and maybe then I'll stop to take questions. So this is our... Um, proposal for how to generate these particular repeater states. So what we need is one emitter that emits a photon and one ancilla qubit. And you can think of this as an MV center in the nuclear spin. Um, so first you generate the entanglement between the emitter and the ancilla, then you pump the emitter. And actually it turns out that the photons that are generated sort of come in between in this entangling structure here. These are the green. Qubits. Then you measure the emitter, which is would be the MV center in our example, and then you re-entangle the emitter and the ancilla. So you see now it puts it in a different spot, and now you can keep going. You can pump that, get new photons out in these arm structures, measure it again and repeat, and then you can get something that begins to have the right structure. And it turns out that if you do a Y measurement on your emitter, then you connect all these inner qubits and get exactly the thing you want. So you can get this with a single emitter and a single ancilla, only two qubits to get this complicated looking structure. Um, so after this work, we also showed, uh, sorry, in this work and in follow-up work, we showed that you can also do a version where you have encoded qubits in the middle like you want. I'm not gonna go over this, but I wanna show you the very last thing I wanna leave you with is that we can generate any graph state, right? And another prototype might come along, a better graph state to do quantum communications. Um, 
through the minimal number of qubits emitters. And we can predict what we need, how we need to manipulate these emitters to get the state we want. So your input into this problem is the photonic graph state you want. And the output this procedure will give you is how many emitters you need. Doesn't matter how complicated the graph is and how you need to pump them. So the main idea here is a reverse engineering approach. You take the final desirable desired state and then you work backwards towards a bunch of photons that are not entangled. And by cleverly using uh, the stabilizer formalism, you can come up with a systematic procedure that tells you what is the circuit, the quantum circuit you need to generate the state. Um, so I'll skip this maybe, uh, but this is one example where we looked at different types of photonic repeaters. This function here tells you, the maximum of this function tells you how many emitters you need. So for this, um, this particular state, this is the, the, the numbers here tell you in what order the photons are emitted. So if you want to emit all the outer photons first, you need six emitters. If you uh, don't have such stringent requirements and you can generate this one first, the second, et cetera, you only need two emitters. And these are the, this is the circuit that produces the state action. Uh, and this is an algorithm that scales polynomially. So you can figure out the circuit in polynomial time um, classically. And uh, I, 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 with that, let me summarize. Um, the theme of this talk was controlling optically active uh, systems. I did narrow it down to the MV center quite a bit, but the techniques are, I showed you are general for other types of defects. Um, and this can impact different types of repeater implementations both these so-called first generation, where you have the memory qubits at the nodes and two-way communication, as well as these more uh, recent proposals for all photonic repeaters. Um, so let me uh, acknowledge uh, people who did most of this work. Uh, the first part of the work was done by independent work by Eva Taku, who's a really talented PhD student in my group. Um, this reverse engineering of photonic graph state generation was done by Beacon, who graduated a few months ago and is now postdoc in Chicago. And Paul Ile, also a very talented uh, physicist, has done a lot of the work, earlier work on uh, photonic graph states. And this is a collaboration with Ed Barnes at Virginia Tech. Uh, and we also have a number of external collaborators listed here. And then let me just show you a picture of our campus. Uh, this is um, some nice nature near Blacksburg. If you ever want to visit, let me know. And we have a bunch of different people working in quantum information uh, science listed here. And this is uh, the new building we're hopefully moving in over the next year. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk. <clears throat> Any further questions for Sophia? Um, yes, I just have a basic question about something. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, hi. Yeah. Hi. So, just just about the the first part of your talk, you had something about um, you're building a network with these uh, these spin defects, and you're trying to like increase the distance of entanglement, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, did I freeze or did he? Oh, I think he's frozen. He froze. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Session hope. I hope you're back. <laughs> oh, oh but here you go. Did I freeze or? Yeah, you did. Yeah, no. you froze for a minute. I'm sorry. I blame the university connection. Um, <laughs> so, is, is the swapping done with two photons at a station in the middle? The entanglement swapping? The entanglement swapping, so if we go, let me maybe try to go there directly. I'm gonna go here. So here, the entanglement swapping, so there's the two photons that implement yeah. the entanglement swapping and connect the remote nodes. Right, right. So and yeah, and then you have entanglement uh, that's remote. And then you swap that into the nuclear spins. So if you look at this last step over here, um, you would also have a connection 
between these two spins. I don't know if you can see my, yeah. maybe I'll try to do it in real time. Let's see how that works, right? You would also have this um, because of this procedure. And now you need to do one more entanglement swapping step, which is to bell measure these two nuclear spins shown over here within the same diamond. Yeah. So and that you, you can do through the elect electronic, the MV center. Okay, got it. So at, at some point you have to measure the two photons in a bell basis. Absolutely. Yes, you okay. need to do it at this so, stage. So just my question was, um, so, okay, you've got this balanced beam splitter to, to do your Hadamard, right? How's the CNOT? Yep. How does the CNOT work to, to get the entanglement? Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's heralded. It's post-selected. So it only works 50% of the time. Oh, and great. that means, okay. yeah, and that means that you need to repeat until success, right? Okay. So that's why these nuclear spins here are very handy because you have stored the quantum information there. Mm -hmm. And that gives you sort of the luxury to keep attempting uh, these entanglement uh, swapping, uh, you know, experiments here to, to succeed, hopefully fast enough that this won't decohere, the nuclear spin won't decohere. Another subtlety here is that while you're exciting the MV center, the nuclear spin feels something, right? Because you're optically driving this uh, qubit that's coupled to its environment, which are the nuclear spins in this case. So this is not as idealized as I've shown. You need to worry about that as well. Okay, all right, thanks a lot. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's thank uh, Sophia again for the very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.